Hello to everyone. Welcome to the Roundtable Citizen Participation and Collective Governance, organized by Open Democracy and System Day. So together, we'll talk about democracy and technology about democracy, for democracy. These last few years, more and more threats has attacked our democracy, fake news, corruption, our inability to take collective decisions faced to the global issues. Civic tech can offer a range of new opportunities to reinvent, redesign our democracy. But together, we'll ask ourselves under which conditions technology can fulfill this promise. What are the, su the success factors and the main challenges of civic techs to reinvent democracy? And we'll do that with our entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs of the French network Open Democracy. But first, let me introduce Pauline Veron, deputy mayor of Paris City in charge of citizen participation. So please, Pauline, take the stage. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Je suis très heureuse de vous voir ici dans notre bel hôtel de ville pour débattre de ces questions de participation citoyenne à l'occasion de ce sommet GovTech. Je voudrais vraiment remercier tous les acteurs de la Civic Tech pour leur mobilisation et leur enthousiasme et pour l'organisation de cette table ronde, en particulier Démocratie ouverte et son incubateur Système D. Alors nous le savons, les temps politiques ne sont pas faciles. Il y a une crise de la représentation démocratique. Nous pouvons le constater, que ce soit déjà depuis plusieurs années à travers un recul de la participation électorale à certaines, dans certains endroits, avec la montée d'un certain nombre de populismes, et aussi une défiance vis-à-vis -vis de la démocratie représentative, constat que nous sommes nombreux à partager. Et face à ce, à ce constat, un peu douloureux, quand on voit aussi dans certains, euh, euh, sur certains euh, sondages, quand on voit notamment que les Français euh, sont de plus en plus nombreux à nous dire que finalement un régime autoritaire euh, pourrait être euh, une solution comme une autre, euh, on ne peut être qu'interrogé et inquiet. Et donc, à la fois avec les acteurs entrepreneurs sociaux qui sont ici, mais aussi en, nous en tant qu'élus, bien sûr nous devons réagir et nous mobiliser et essayer de reconnecter euh, les citoyens, la société civile avec euh, ces institutions, avec euh, le fonctionnement de la démocratie, euh, si nous euh, voulons que les choses s'améliorent. Alors, euh, restaurer euh, la confiance dans l'action publique, cela passe par une autre façon de faire de la politique, par euh, une reconnexion avec les citoyens grâce à de nombreux outils euh, qui existent et qui euh, sont de plus en plus nombreux, notamment grâce au numérique. Et donc, euh, c'est bien l'objet de, de la table ronde que vous allez euh, euh, avoir euh, tout de suite. Euh, ces outils numériques, c'est vrai, nous ont permis d'avoir un nouvel âge de la participation citoyenne pour aller euh, chercher des nouvelles personnes, des jeunes, des gens connectés, mais aussi euh, l'ensemble de la population pour revenir vers des dispositifs où l'on débat, où l'on échange, pas simplement sur les réseaux, mais aussi dans des réunions euh, en présentiel avec les différents acteurs pour faire vivre euh, le débat, parce que euh, la démocratie, c'est certes euh, des, des questions institutionnelles, mais c'est d'abord la façon dont nous débattons, dont nous mettons en délibération, dont nous construisons ensemble, la capacité à pouvoir entendre un point de vue différent du sien et de pouvoir échanger, débattre, pas forcément pour arriver au consensus, mais euh, tout simplement pour comprendre que dans la société, il peut y avoir des points de vue différents et que donc l'intérêt général est là aussi pour prendre en compte les différents points de vue et arbitrer. Alors à Paris, depuis 2014, avec Anne Hidalgo, euh, nous avons euh, élaboré une, une ambitieuse politique de démocratie participative. Nous, avons, euh, nous essayons de déployer un maximum d'outils euh, pour euh, permettre aux Parisiens de s'engager, de venir débattre, de venir échanger sur la politique municipale, sur l'avenir de leur, de leur ville. 
Et nous avons bien sûr pour cela utilisé aussi les outils numériques. Alors je, je ne rentrerai pas dans le détail, mais juste pour que vous, vous ayez une idée globale de, de ce que nous avons entrepris depuis 2014, je rappellerai que bien sûr nous avons un conseil parisien de la jeunesse et il y a des jeunes présents aujourd'hui à nos débats. Nous avons bien sûr des conseils de quartier, dans tout 123 conseils de quartier dans Paris, où les Parisiens peuvent débattre de l'avenir de leur quartier. Mais nous avons aussi créé un conseil des générations futures, avec des citoyens tirés au sort pour réfléchir à l'avenir et aux enjeux de demain à Paris. Nous avons une e-pétition qui permet aux citoyens de mettre à l'ordre du jour du conseil municipal des sujets euh, qu'ils souhaitent euh, voir euh, débattre. Nous avons bien sûr un site id.paris qui est une plateforme euh, de débat, une plateforme où nous euh, faisons des consultations sur tous les sujets de la vie municipale. Nous avons aussi créé une carte citoyenne qui permet aux, aux Parisiens, aujourd'hui ils sont plus de 200 000, d'avoir accès à des ateliers citoyens, à des événements municipaux, à pouvoir comprendre comment fonctionne la ville, comment fonctionnent les institutions et savoir comment y prendre leur part. Et puis bien sûr, nous avons mis en place un budget participatif de très grande ampleur puisque 100 millions d'euros chaque année sont consacrés à ce budget participatif et nous avons plus de 200 000 votants, soit 10% de la population qui participe aux choix euh, proposés par les Parisiens eux-mêmes. Et puis, au-delà de ce que nous, nous pouvons mettre en œuvre, nous essayons euh, de travailler le plus possible avec les représentants de la Civic Tech, avec les entrepreneurs de la Civic Tech. Euh, ils ont des outils à nous proposer, nous élus, nous institutions. Nous essayons euh, de, de au maximum nous en servir. Euh, notre plateforme euh, de participation est euh, bien sûr une plateforme qui est euh, issue de la Civic Tech parisienne. Et au-delà de notre soutien aussi à travers un, des appels à projets, nous avons créé une halle civique, un Civic Hall à Paris, euh, qui est euh, animé et organisé par les acteurs de la, notamment de la Civic Tech euh, parisienne, dont vous avez ici euh, plusieurs représentants, et qui euh, a mis en place l'incubateur euh, Système D, euh, dont vous, vous allez entendre parler. Donc voilà tout, toutes ces actions, même si... Euh, elles ont en vocation à encore plus prendre d'ampleur. Je crois que Paris s'est engagé depuis quatre ans pleinement dans ce renouveau démocratique, dans cette délibération nécessaire, dans un projet plus global de défense et d'amélioration de la démocratie, dans notre intérêt à tous. Et quand je vois à quel point ce sont des jeunes qui portent toutes ces initiatives de Civic Tech et de renouveau de la participation citoyenne, je pense que nous pouvons être optimistes. En tout cas, nous le devons et soyez sûrs que je serai toujours là pour échanger avec vous sur ces sujets et pour vous soutenir dans cette démarche. Merci beaucoup. So let's move on to the round table and let me introduce our uh, panelists. So we have Katharina Host from D21, Ninon Lagarde from Tous Cellus, Clara Douce McGrath from Vox, Colline Van Roy from uh, Cap Collectif, and uh, Quentin uh, Sauzé from uh, Echo. And uh, I'm not introducing uh, all the civic texts now because they will uh, talk about them uh, during their, their speeches. Um, so first, let me remind you why we need more citizen participation. It's not about fashion. It's not about uh, ni a nice thing to do. Citizen participation brings more efficacy to the public policies. It brings uh, also more social acceptance. It brings more, um, more dynamism in our democracy because it puts back the citizen in the center of the public debate. But citizen participation is not only about quantity, about massifying uh, the number of citizens uh, involved in civic text. It's also about the quality, the engineering of civic text. So 
uh, let's uh, spend a, a bit of time about what is a good civic tech, what is the engineering of citizen participation. And so to begin with, uh, I will introduce uh, Colin Van Roa from CAP Collective. Uh, Col uh, so CAP Collective is the French leader in citizen participation. Uh, Colin, under which conditions technology can integrate citizen input so it makes uh, the policies more efficient? Uh, thank you. Is it uh, working? Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, as I said, uh, CAP Collective uh, uh, is a French uh, company dedicated to enhance all your public decision with uh, collective intelligence. Basically, we are developing an online consultation platform for decision makers, and we've been uh, experimenting uh, for five years now with more than uh, 200 of uh, national or local governments, like the city of Paris, uh, companies, trade unions, and uh, NGOs. Just one example, uh, in 2015, the French uh, government for the first time in Europe has worked with more than 20,000 people online uh, to improve their digital uh, lobby. Uh, so, uh, digital to us um, has to be considered as a tool, of course, um, and not a button that you can simply uh, push to make it work. I mean, assets of digital technology have to rely on methodological choices to be effective. And I insist on methodology because uh, I think that what matters today is not only to participate in the digital era, uh, it's to make better decisions and concrete politics. Um, and so our platform is a, a technical translation of our vision of participation. Um, to be short, I will try to, to summarize in three uh, main guidelines of our vision. Uh, first, uh, we seek to um, empower both the citizen and the politician. Uh, by providing a tool for decision support. So our goal is not to create uh, a citizen lobby. Um, and as a consequence, we, we do not start from a blank page on the platform. Um, there are initial proposals made by the decision maker that citizens come to enrich and challenge. Secondly, our platform um, is not intended to create consensus um, which is quite a nonsense, but to spell out the senses thanks to uh, an organized framework. Third, we are not aiming uh, for perfect representation uh, because we are not a polling institute. What we are looking for is um, to collect diversity of opinions um, and to widen the usual circle of um, expert assessments and opinions um, to give ourselves more chances to efficiently identify and qualify the needs and to bring more appropriate solutions. So in conclusion, um, this is a kind of crowdsourcing approach and that's the way, uh, the most efficient way we found to, to try to contribute to improve representative uh, democracy. Okay, th thank you. So uh, citizen participation needs uh, methodology to be useful and not counterproductive to democracy. D21, or D21 in French, uh, has a, another methodology. Can, can you tell uh, us more about it? Yes, sure. Will it work or should I? Yeah, no. Hello. Thank, thanks, Aurore. I, I, I agree with everything that has been said, and I think it's, um, it's good practice or even consensus among uh, civic tech players that the tool is not the, um, the entity itself, that methodology is more, more important, and that we cannot ensure presentativity and so on. Um, it's also true that tech is getting uh, commoditized, so um, it's quite easy to uh, create a tech tool. Um, any tool can be uh, replicated quite uh, quite easily, so it doesn't make sense to start with a tech. You have to start with a problem, and uh, and see what uh, what the desired outcome is and uh, what tool we can use for it. Um, we totally agree uh, with all of this, and we try to emulate the same thing at D21. Um, but historically, we started with um, with another thinking uh, because we thought about voting outcomes and how they um, how they are affected by the by the voting method. 
Um, as you can engineer participation, you can also engineer election outcomes. Uh, we all know that very well. And uh, so we looked at how voting methods uh, influence um, election outcomes and how we can optimize them, not for the politicians, but for society as a whole and for citizens. So um, in this context, we did research on, on voting methods and uh, currently are mainly using the Janicek method uh, developed by our founder, which basically uses multiple votes and uh, plus and minus votes to, um, to better prioritize um, uh, candidates at the election or um, ideas, proposals in a participatory budgeting. And, uh, and that's basically, yes, the innovation we are trying to, to foster, which maybe is um, applicable, applicable more to participation of um, large-scale participation, where, where um, hundreds of thousands of people, or even millions of people need to come together, come to a decision. So we have, on the spectrum, we have participation that is more uh, qualitative, that, uh, that revolves around proposal making, but then at some point you need to prioritize the proposals. And I think uh, where we're working at and what we do best is basically prioritizing and finding consensus um, uh, for people, for, for a large number, for a large group of people. Okay. Um. One of the main challenges of civic tech is to be inclusive, because we often talk about the fact that they are mostly used by young people, uh, digital natives, very well educated people. Uh, Colleen or, or Katharina, very shortly, can, can you tell us uh, the part of young people in, uh, in the panel of citizen particip participation when you implement, uh, for example, participatory budget or co consultations? Are there uh, uh, most of, uh, of the people who use your civic tech? Young people are very difficult to engage. I just uh, recently met with a group of high school students and we asked them, how do, you, how do you work in your group, in your school? And then the youth just looked at me like totally in, you know, bored and then he said, we use Snap. And I was like, okay, we don't work with SNAP, so even the civic tech is maybe a bit behind what you young people are really uh, wor uh, working with. Uh, participation of young people in our projects are, are rather low. So um, that's, that's a whole different story, but uh, quickly to your question. So basically the, um, the on the ground thing we, we do through um, train the trainers, so we train volunteers, we train uh, or paid facilitators, um, especially in um, developing countries, this is an approach that is, works very well, so basically not only do you enable the young leaders um, of a country, of, um, of a local community, you also basically multiply your own forces because it's always more difficult to have internal employees going on the ground than actually demultiplying uh, you know, your, your team. And also uh, we work with paid paper ballots that are, um, uh, can be uh, counted automatically. And uh, this is also a way that has proven very effective to um, increase participation in city, um, in city participation projects. Clara Dous, so you work for uh, Vox. Um, you, you address uh, young people specifically. Um, how, how can we make them participate more? Uh, are there ways that are more efficient than others? How do you do uh, in Vox to, to bring young people to the political uh, debate? Hi, um, so my name is Clara and I work for Vox. Um, Vox is a civic tech initiative that aims at better informing millennials so that they engage in the public debate. And regarding to um, engaging them in consultations or in uh, participatory uh, democracy, we have reached a, the figure, the idea that millennials want to be engaged in on a variety of topic and not necessarily topics that will interest young people, as in um, youth, uh, pol youth policies and, and et cetera. They are actually interested in a vari variety of topics and we can't limit their participation to just being topics for young people. Again, the other issue is that they are very difficult to reach for government organizations or local government. In that sense, we help uh, or, uh, public agencies in the public sector to reach them on social media, 
on uh, Snapchat, for example, or on Instagram, because public participation is already a complicated issue in which they don't feel legitimate. If we don't go and get them where they actually are, there's no way that they'll come over and participate in these sorts of consultation, which is why and which is our job at Vox is to mediate between the public sector, these in great initiatives to get par uh, citizen participation and millennials. Okay, Ninon Lagarde. Um, do, do you think young people don't participate because um, they think that their concerns are not taken into account or that it's just a, a matter of communication channel? Um, yeah, can, can you uh, present Tous Élus? Because with Tous Élus, we, we, the thing which is uh, very interesting is that um, citizen participation for you, it's not only uh, bringing young people to elections, it's, it's also empower them to uh, make them become representatives. Thank you. Yes, exactly. That's a real good question. Why do young people don't vote and how can we uh, tackle these issues? At Toussaint, we are a young organization. Uh, we started last year and our bet is to say that young people don't vote, but young people are more involved in civil society and civic issues than ever. So how can we make the link between politics and young people's involvement and engagement into society? We at Tous Élus think that people should feel like they could be candidate, that they could be politician, and that should be something that is close to them. That's why we decided to offer free online training, civic education, in order to face all the, to help young people to find the proper answer to their qu to how can I become a politician? Like concretely, how do I become a politician? Where do I resi register to be candidate for the local election in 2020? We are trying to face that, um, that challenge, which is to make real link between, okay, the young people are involved, they are part of a lot of organization, they still protest, they still uh, vote online for petition, etc. but they don't see the real impact of politics in their daily lives. So for us, we are trying to make people understand the impact of politics, like why is there a bench here, why is there a bike, uh, ride all over your city or not. We are trying to make people understand the impact of politics at the local level to make them feel that they could be the one who are taking those, those action, those position. And that's what we are trying to do thanks to technology. We use uh, micro learning videos, we are building a serious game, we are do using a lot of online tools, but we think that we cannot achieve our goal if we don't meet properly our participants, if we don't make them feel like they are part of a team and if we are not on the grassroots, uh, on, on the field to, to meet them for real. Cla Clara? <coughs> uh, so, what do you think about it? Do you think uh, young people uh, uh, don't participate because they think their, their concerns are, no take, are not taken into account? Or... Uh, that it's just a communication matter. I do agree um, that young people don't vote and don't participate because they don't feel they're taken into account. But over on top of that, they don't participate because they don't feel legitimate enough. They don't feel like they have enough information to participate, which is an essential element of what we do at Vox. The, the core element of Vox is to explain the public debate, explain how it works, explain who are the actors in present, explain what are the issues, so that young people feel legitimate enough to then go towards Ninon and actually take a step further and pr present themselves as candidates to at local elections. Okay, thank you. So uh, let's move to uh, um, another topic. Um, we see that participation and collective governance uh, are also about empowering citizens and blurring the lines between citizenship and representation. Um, Quentin, so you co-founded ECHO, a citizen lobby. Uh, you worked from, for MPs uh, at Parliament. Uh, and you're conv convinced that we should reinvent the collaboration between representatives and citizens 
um, because there is a, a lack of traduction of their languages. Uh, can you elaborate on this matter? Thank you all. I was just wondering, can you hear us properly? Because I think there's a lot of echo, so uh, yeah, more or less, right? So I'll, <laughs> I'll try to be, to be as clear as possible. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to start because I'm very amazed because I'm the only man in this panel, and I think it's great. Very happy to, to see that, actually. Because yeah. I can tell you it's, it's, not, the, it's not the case that often. Uh, just to present ECO, uh, ECO is a citizen lobby, as you said, Aurore. Um, so we organize workshops all throughout the territory with uh, citizens from uh, all over. Those guys, they participate, we debate, and then we gather those ideas, those propositions, and we try then to use exactly the same tools as any other lobby, and we push those ideas uh, to MPs, to the governments. Um, so to, to, to answer uh, uh, your question, um, there's a big problem because I'm still amazed that some people are actually coming to our workshops because participative washing uh, is still happening today. There's a lot of meetings happening, a lot of public meetings where people come and they express their feelings, they express their ideas, and it ends up in a file somewhere in uh, an office of a representative and there's no effect. And I think that's exactly what we have to target. Um, this missing link, missing link between all those tools, technical tools, and uh, of course, physical tools that we have to gather people, to help them to debate, and this missing link, link between this and the representative. And that's, that's something that we're trying to address to create this, this language, this link between those two worlds. Um, I think too often, uh, I was talking about that with some, uh, some of, our, um, of my friends here. Too often, elected people, representatives, think that uh, collaborative democracy or participative democracy is something happening against them. And our work is to make them understand that, uh, at the contrary, uh, it is happening because we want to help them to do a better job. Yeah, I, and uh, I'd go further. Um, because I think we need to switch uh, our presentation of uh, power from power on citizens to power with citizens. Um, and thinking about that, we can imagine a, a third way between representative uh, democracy and direct democracy um, with new models of governance based on collective intelligence and uh, you know, crowdsourcing, uh, and we could also uh, think about, I mean, in this kind of multi-stakeholder uh, governance model, uh, we need to redesign our culture about institutions as well, and a way to uh, make decisions. Uh, Quentin, I, I know that you are uh, quite uh, familiar with uh, sociocracy, or you um, you, yeah, you, you read some uh, things about it and uh, you're interested in that topic. Uh, do you think we could uh, in, be inspired by sociocracy to redesign our uh, new uh, governance models? Yeah, of course. The idea is that uh, there's a huge democratic, uh, democratic crisis happening right now in all over the world, in liberal democracies, you see people going out of the political game. Either they don't vote anymore, or they'll be ready to vote for people that are offering them a solution to go and leave democracy. And so you need to consider and see how we can make democracy evolve to actually face those new expectations of the people. Definitely, the, there are some tools uh, existing, like sociocracy, which is a way to organize um, an organization or a collectivity uh, on a more horizontal approach. But the idea is simple. Um, right now, more or less, all our organizations are structured through a vertical approach, starting from school here in France, where you have a teacher who is the only one having the good answer. There's only one way for this answer. And you don't collaborate with your friends or your schoolmates to actually find this answer. And you have to change this mentality, because this is not 
how it's working now in the world. People are collaborating, people are changing information. The information is everywhere. Either it's right or other, it's completely false. But the information is there. So leadership cannot be effective now with the retention of this information. Leader leadership is now promoted through the actual organization of this horizontality. So to end up, the idea is more or less, especially representative, they think that verticality means efficiency. Horizontality means anarchy, hell. And what we are trying to promote is to make them understand that if you want to move from a vertical approach to a, a really efficient horizontal approach, you need more rules, you need more processes. And definitely, sociocracy is one answer to this issue. OK. So we see that the way to go is very long and that we are not going to redesign our democracy completely tomorrow. But today, from today on, we can uh, work on that, uh, on that issues. And so I would like to hear you about the success factors of civic tech for today. And so, Colin, uh, I, I know that you've already uh, thought a lot about it. Can you uh, share your, your convictions on this matter? I think there are two big uh, challenges uh, for us today. The difficulty uh, to push forward a um, century old governance model and the gap between citizens and politicians, which is at least as important as the digital gap. Uh, for instance, 89% of the French people consider that uh, uh, their politicians don't care um, at all about what they want, and 70% consider that democracy is not going so well. Uh, what I want to mean is that even when uh, requested, uh, participation doesn't come naturally because a lot of people uh, are doubtful. Um, and so in, remedy, in order to remedy this, um, the key thing is the, the integrity of the process. Um, so I, I think there are three main elements to, to success this. A good decision maker, a good process, and a good communication. Um, a good decision maker um, has to be convinced of the process and get involved all along, uh, has to choose a subject uh, which is a high priority for him or her, uh, not a priority, a high priority, and on which uh, he or she has... Why, why a high priority? Uh, because I, I have a... I have a lot of customers who want to try civic tech uh, because they want to be, a, uh, they want to try to be an innovation. That's not a good start. Uh, and then they tell me that they want to start with something uh, which doesn't really have importance for them. So it can't work like that because if a subject is not important for you, that's just because it's not important for the citizens. So it's really a key point. Um, then you have to make uh, commitments clear before the beginning of the consultation, um, knowing that a clear commitment is obviously not to say yes to everything or to everyone, um, but more to undertake their arbitrations at the end of the consultation. As for the process, it has to be t transparent, of course. Uh, that's one of the assets of digital technology. Uh, the rules have to be the same for everyone. There can't be a parallel process with uh, uh, lobbies and uh, experts on one hand and citizens on the other end. Everyone can and have to uh, contribute at the same place. Also, you have to promote free speech with uh, no moderation prior to being online. Uh, and also, anonymity option is really important online. And also, you have to articulate face-to-face -face participation and digital participation instead of opposing the two, claiming that one is better than the other. It's quite a nonsense. And at least uh, a good communication, it's obvious, because uh, you can have the best process ever if nobody knows it. Uh, it's quite useless, of course. And what is interesting to notice about those three elements, um, they only depend on decision makers' will. So it's a question of acculturation, of course. Yeah. Katharina, what do you think? Um, do you think representative 
don't trust citizens. Uh, and that it's for that reason that they do not consult them on high priorities? Yeah, yes, that um, resounds with your first point about the, um, the right decision maker. So um, indeed, from, from our experience, and I'm, I'm sure it's not a representative sample, but, uh, but it's what we, uh, we live day to day. Uh, basically, when, when interacting with public decision makers, you always feel some kind of hesitation, like they, they are intrigued, they're interested by, by participation, they, they are quite convinced, um, uh, they like your tools and so on, it's all very good, but you, you feel that they're hesitant because they say, okay, we do it, but we will not publish the results immediately. Okay, we'll do it, but we only ask this question. We will not ask this question. Okay, we'll do it, we'll ask this question, but we will not put this option in, in the question. So you feel that there's a very careful engineering that might be related to some distrust or some, yeah, carefulness um, uh, or even, yeah, fear from the process. And I would say they are right. I'm not saying they, they should be totally trusting the process and just go with it because you need to start small. You need to experiment first and um, it's, it's totally okay. But, um, but still, you, I think you should have at least in mind that after first experimentation where maybe the budget is smaller, where maybe the questions are not so important, that you gradually aim to, um, to more ambitious processes um, after this, um, after a learning phase. So, yeah, that's, that's our experience. And so, Clara, regarding young people participation, what is your main challenge? I guess they're different. Well, um, some of the ch challenges are shared and especially because uh, we have a lot of our clients who come toward, towards us in the case of consultations, wanting young people to participate in these consultations. And then I definitely agree with you, Corinne, in, in the sense that when you are starting an initiative, a participation initiative, you have to think the communication as well as the global operation because the communication is a key success factor. Um, the other point, which is to me the biggest challenge, is that um, deci uh, decision makers do not, um, because millennials do not participate, sh participate much, they do not count on millennials participating at all, which is a big issue because today it's 20% of the population, but it will soon be most of the voters and most of the people who will get these decision makers elected. So it's essential to include them and not just be happy because a couple of them participated, but actually have an aggressive um, campaign towards them to actually get their participation. So there's, there's a need for a mind shift in that sense. And so Nino, uh, do you think young people uh, should participate uh, to uh, Con institutional consultations or uh, take the power uh, and, uh, and, yeah, and, and become representatives, representatives by themselves? I think young people should do both, of course. There is no, uh, like, a participation is all, doesn't mean anything and nobody taking, taking account about what is said. So let's be all elected and let's all be politicians. That's not the proper answer for that. But we think that making people feel like they have a real access to one of their rights, which is being elected as a politician, will also help them participate to those consultation. And they will understand that, okay, I'm a, ci I I'm a citizen like everyone else, and I can be elected, I can participate to, to civil participation, and I will be heard. And that's m the most important thing, in fact. Let's be trying to be heard and to see that if I taking some sometimes to fill in like a, a form online to participate or to attend to a meeting or a consultation on a, online or offline. I want my time to and my answer to be listened to and to, to, have a, to see a real change after that. That's why I completely agree with you. All those participation, the, the real key is communication of the result after that because otherwise I participate once and after I don't see any of my words and proposition into the the, the results of the consultation, so next time I won't be there. Okay. Uh, Quentin, uh, for, from a more global point of view, what is the main challenge for uh, democratic innovation today to succeed in reloading democracy? 
How much time do I have for that? And that's much, I'm sorry. Oh my God. Okay, so you'll have to stop me. Eh? Um, I was thinking when you were talking about the young people and stuff that if I were a politician, I would definitely target the old people because we are in an aging country and the old people, they vote, they vote massively and definitely there's something going on there. And I think somehow we'll have to target also this, all this massive public uh, that uh, old people represent. Um, in terms of, of the democratic approach, uh, uh, the situation that we have uh, to me is, uh, is very frightening, I have to say. Uh, uh, the democratic crisis is happening now and we have to face it. The issue that we have in France is that the only tool where the citizens have the final word is the vote. So basically you just ask citizens to show up if they still consider that those guys are representing them, they vote every five years, every six years, depending on the elections, and that's it. So right now, if you look at our constitution and the institutions that we have, we have no possibility to actually make sure that the participative approach will have an effect, that we are not relying on any representative decision or goodwill. And that's, I think that's a big issue. Uh, Thanks to uh, uh, the new government, we have a constitutional reform coming, probably January next year, something like that. But the problem that we have with this constitutional reform is the approach itself, because what they've done is that they are producing a text, they're producing a constitution reform in their offices in, in, in the Elysee Palace, and then they'll push this text to the legislative body or to the citizens. And to me, and to most of the people involved in this ecosystem, that's definitely not what you are supposed to do if you want to make particip participation happening. You need to start from the bottom, you need to go all over the territory and ask the people what is happening with our democracy, how can we fix it? And then you can produce proposition ideas and then gather them into a constitutional reform and maybe people will be interested in that reform. And definitely, I think that's something that we, citizens, uh, NGOs, uh, social enterprise, we have to target and we have to focus on. I know you want to stop me uh, and, and, and I'll stop there, Aurore, but I, 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 cannot, I really want to insist on that point. I think it's very critical that we take the chance of this constitutional reform and try to activate all our communities to push and make the government understand that this is a critical point for our democracy. Yeah, thank you, Quentin, uh, because that is the main challenge, I think, uh, for civic tech, democratic innovation and democracy. Um, and so definitely civic techs are tools that can improve our Act, uh, our uh, current system, but we need to completely redesign our institutions and political culture. And so that is a, a society matter and not only civic tech matter. So Sorry, Aurore, let, let me word. just add a point there. The tools already exist. We, know we don't need to invent them. There are countries all over the world using them. So it's just a matter of selecting them and decide which are the ones, like yours exactly, that could be used. So it's not a technical issue. It's not a problem of designing a new software. It's, not a, it's only a mentality issue and a problem to actually make the people's voice happening. Thank you. Uh, j just two words because we are running late. Okay, sorry. Just two last words for public actors. It's mostly not to be afraid of the people because as Quentin was saying, the tools already exist, okay. the, uh, the initiatives already exist, and there is n no way that have it, hearing the people's voices will actually create an entire revolution. Okay. Thank you to all of you. You're amazing. Please continue to reinvent democracy, and thank you to our audience.